What's up guys and gals, it's time for some more Record of Ragnarok content. It's your host of the most, Griever, as always, bringing you guys season number 2222, two, 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 episode review for episode number 5, entitled Requiem. And before we even get into the details, the meat and potatoes, if you will, of the episode, and I do, of course, have my notes as always, like I do for every episode review, I just want to come out and say it right at the beginning of the video, best episode so far, easily. Easily better than episode one, which is still on a lot of people's best episode list so far. A lot of people uh, prefer episode one over the later episodes. Some people are arguing because there's heavier on the CGI, so I kind of get it. Heavier on the CGI in later episodes, but this episode, better than all previous four episodes so far. Now, I know a lot of people have probably already binged all ten episodes, and maybe there is a better episode out of, you know, from six through ten. But right now, episode five just... Boom, beats everything out of the water. And it's not hard to understand why. A lot of people like myself had episode one at the top of their bracket uh, for a little while when we first watched the first few episodes. No different than Bleach, Thousand Year Blood War arc. Bleach is back. There was hype surrounding the season. In this case, it was more a negative hype surrounding Record of Ragnarok. But either way, when it comes out and the product and the quality is good, like episode one was, same with Bleach, uh, a lot of people can't get over the Record Ragnarok's back. It's round four. Yeah, let's go. And episode one feels just that much stronger for starting it, for doing the beginning. Same with Bleach. It took until people got to about episode five and six of Bleach before people started going, okay, okay. Finally got over the fact that Bleach is back. Episode one is hype. Now let's actually look at the episodes from a more critical point of view. It's no different than this one. But the fact of the matter is episode five just blows all four episodes out of the water. Easily. Easily. And we're going to get into why, of course. Because this episode, like, all right, let's just begin. Oh, that was episode four. All right, episode five. Episode five. Uh, Got to get the right notes here. So episode five, they open up with, uh, it's a scene from the manga. There's not anything added, I don't believe, that I can recall. I did uh, re recheck some of the manga chapters just to clarify some things and how the pacing went in certain scenes. But other than that, I, I didn't really exactly reread the whole fight, so... Not 100%, but uh, they open up with Jack in a what-if scenario. They open him up with this whole idea of what if things had gone correctly. Sort of, that's the, why the character of Anne is underrated but important to Jack's character because they're showcasing had Jack was a circumstances outside of his control. Jack became what he was due to just a, a slew of factors that he basically had very little chance to become anything but what he was. Compa considering the situation he was in, the circumstances, the people around him, the people that influenced him, all these things, plus his God-given ability of seeing the emotions and the colors uh, based in emotions of people, really warped his sense of self and, and a lot of other, and the sense of other people and how they matter, how they don't matter. He started to lack certain things. But now in the beginning of this episode, very appropriate start is to see the what if. What if, you know, it, everything had gone the proper way, people had been nice, if the circumstances had been different, would Jack have been a murderer would he, or would he have been a happy child growing up? And we can see that yes, he, he would have been fine. And Anne points that out at, I believe, the last episode. She points out the whole, like, nobody will take pity on this poor boy. He, he deserves pity not ridicule, and we really need to showcase that. So it's something to be said for that. Uh, it's a nice, powerful scene just opening up. It's very quick, but it's really nice. Then we get into the fact that uh, we have the greatest ending. We have the greatest ending. I mean, you could argue round two has the strongest ending, and I will give you that. Round two had an incredibly strong ending. But round four is arguably still the best round. Most people put round four as the best round. And it's not hard to understand why I personally can't see any of the other rounds, no matter how good they are. You know, the character, the characterization of Adam, the first win uh, by humanity by Sasuke, all these things are great. They're, they're fantastic. But they can't top the characterization and the depth in round four. And now we get to finally see the ending animated. It was done emotionally well. There was no music. That's the key thing. There was no music in the uh, final clash between Heracles and Jack. It was just sound effects. Straight up, just sound effects of, you know, Jack and Heracles going at it for a final clash before the dear god pierces Heracles. Now, 
The cool thing here is that's when the OST starts up. The OST starts up, it's absolutely fantastic. And even though I have been saying, now I watched both the Japanese, of course, and the English, but I am so much, I'm so invested in Jack's English VA that I'm honestly, once again, I think the English episode tops the Japanese episode uh, for this particular, for episode five here, because Jack's, the emotion in his voice acting, and though I have complained about the monotone or the lack of heavy emotion behind the feeling behind Heracles' VA. The voice is okay for Heracles, but the lack of power and, and emotion behind his voice has left a little bit to be desired. It's been kind of monotone, kind of stagnant. This is probably his best voice acting as Heracles, was right here after the Dear God. He has this fantastic speech. The OST is nice and slow. You hear that low choir in the background sort of idea as Heracles and Jack exchange this I, the, the ideologies and he's like, well, did, did I not say, basically saying, did I not save you in the end? Did you end up changing my color? You won, but did you change my color? And Jack looks shocked and realizes, no, I no, maybe I was wrong. I, I, I couldn't change him. And he says, you're such a stubborn god. It's my loss and stuff. And Heracles said, then that's good. That means, and almost like Heracles was making confirmation that yes, even in death, I knew I wouldn't change, but it's nice to hear it that you're not going to lie. You're not going to cheat this out. You know that I, you know, I followed my words right until death and beyond death. I have followed my convictions. I followed my honor. I followed my pride, my words, and I said I would save you. And to a degree, he was successful because now Jack is starting to question just about everything. And we get to see that. So a bit of spoilers ahead, I think, in this episode to talk about this. But spoilers ahead for only anime only viewers, I urge you not to continue listening. Uh, come back later, maybe, I don't know. Um, but the fact of the matter is we see that change in Jack uh, in, in later chapters. I'll try to keep it a little spoiler free, but we do see, we get to see Jack again and stuff like that in later chapters. And we do get to see the calming change in Jack to a degree. And I'm excited to see more of Jack's character going forward. I know there's a spinoff, but the spinoff is absolute garbage, so we'll, we'll, we won't talk about that. Um, but yeah, so it's the perfect fit. Heracles falls. It's absolutely amazing. And Jack's, the, the speech there where he says, like, you didn't change my color, uh, Brunhilde, I'm sorry, you know, I still... And the big thing is, of course, he says, remember one thing, Jack. Boom, and he's gonna, and you think he's gonna hit, and we see Jack's eyes moving like, oh, is it gonna be a double KO? And he grabs him and hugs him to his chest and says, I will always love mankind. I still love humanity. And it's just like, yes. And Jack is just beside himself. You know, the night is over. Dawn rises. You know, the sunshine peeks through as Jack looks on into the distance. Uh, Heracles crystallizes and falls and is gone. Of course, everybody is extremely upset. Even though it's a W for humanity, it doesn't feel like a victory. That's one of the biggest things, too, about round four that sets it apart, is that the gods are always on the god side. And the humans are always, of course, on the human side. This is the one exception, the one exception where it's conflicted, where it's absolutely conflicted on humanity's side. Humanity a big chunk of them are, are upset and crying. They don't want Heracles to die. They wanted Heracles to win. And many of the humans and gods are upset at the death of Heracles. It's almost a universal hatred of Jack, even by the human side. Now, some humans, of course, realize that it is still good for a W, but many are upset because Heracles was such a champion of good, of justice. So it's, the, it's those little differences is why round four is basically it's insurmountable as far as all the other rounds are concerned all, all the way up to round eight the, you can't defeat that level of characterization that level of difference between all the other fights between all the other rounds it stands alone as doing something incredibly different in that regard um and one of the other things is the well the animation was still solid i do have it written here the animation is still extremely solid in this episode no more 3d because the fight's over right so there's no more cgi it's absolutely uh it's 
well handled. Uh, the colorization, the color of the sunrise and stuff like that, the dawn shining on Jack and stuff like that as he's, you know, taking in the fact that he killed a god and all this stuff. And that's brought up, of course, because uh, Hulk, I believe her name is, Hulk. Uh, she, of course, the gloves are gone and the Volander is ended and she's there and saying, so how do you feel now? And he's like, I, I would like to see what my color is. I wish I could see my own color because I've never experienced this emotion before. And she tells him, so you don't even, you can't even tell when you're sad. Well, that's just, that's pitiful. You're such a pitiful man. You don't even know when you're upset. And it's like... Wait, what? And once again, the characterization is solid here because then Jack walks off. It's well done. The OST is still there. There's not a sense of victory. There's no sense of victory for either side here. Uh, the, the OST doesn't even make it seem like the uh, humanities want to fight. It, feel, it feels like everybody lost. Nobody won. Even Jack didn't win because he finally found someone who gave a shit. Who actually gave a shit about him. Now granted, Anne did of course as well, but that was more once again, Jack was already gone by the time she couldn't help. Heracles wanted to help, tried to help, and I would argue successfully ended up put Jack on the path to maybe not redemption, but a, a path of healing, a path of, of restoration, a path, something away from the darkness. You know, a light at the end of the tunnel in some regard. He's not there yet, but he set him on the right course. And the fact of the matter is, as I said, Jack didn't even win because his one wish wasn't to kill a god. Now his wish at the end of the fight after doing it, he goes, if I could have one wish, I would just wish to see you again once more. One more time. He just wants to see Heracles. He just wants Heracles back. The one person, the one god, the one person that cared about him, that actually gave a shit. So... It was so well handled. It's seeing it animated, and once again, Jack's English VA, 11 out of 10, just absolutely destroying, uh, completely just decimating our hearts. Like, he just did a fantastic job. Can't be top, perfect voice actor for Jack. Um, so, yeah, and the another scene that I really loved in the manga, and I'm glad it was handled extremely well. The voice acting, once again, handled quite well. Uh, maybe little nitpicks here and there, but the fact that Brunhilde is shown that she's like, well, Jack won, I'm gonna move on, Goal scolds her and stuff, and we see that she's upset, and they could have ended it at this. This is the thing, both the manga and the anime do very well at doing this. They could have ended it at the fact that she is upset. She's clenching her fist so tight that her brother Heracles is gone, who, he's dead, and it's basically her fault. It's partly her fault. She started Ragnarok, she started you know, the chain, you can't stop a chain reaction once you get the ball rolling, right? So she's bleeding from the fist and we know she's upset. But then they add, they just, they double down on Brunhilde being upset. She goes to this room, we didn't know it existed. She's there, she sees there's Adam and Lu Bu in, enshrined with like a goblet of like holy water or something like that sort of, or it might, might be wine, divine something, whatever. Um, but it's all, it, it's a bit of an, an enshrinement. Because once again, they can't, they can't come back from this. Their soul is destroyed. This is it. There, there is no other plane of existence, a second heaven for the gods or something like that. No, when they're gone, they're gone forever and they will never return. They will never be back. They're not living somewhere else. They're gone. And the fact of the matter is, is that she goes there, she enshrines Heracles with the other humans and and not Poseidon and all them of course but enshrines them with the other humans which is something that I want to bring up Hermes and Brunhilde at the end of season one an added scene that is not in the manga they are discussing something we don't know what it was we never heard any words about it and there's a bit of huh what's going on here right a lot of people have made many theories about that however spoilers for the manga we know that Hermes also has been writing odes to regardless it, whether it's humanity side or the god side he's been writing ballads he's been writing odes to these uh to, he's been writing requiems to the fallen warriors in each round it doesn't matter if they're the god who fell or the human who fell he's been writing beautiful melodies for these beautiful songs um you know these sonnets and stuff like that he's been writing these uh you know, from a musical perspective, and now we also see that Brunhilde on the other side is also enshrining the losses, though hers is more specific, 
just for the humanity, but of course, Brother Heracles, it was sort of a different, and she even brings up, some would call this blasphemous, that I'm enshrining you with the humans, but you wouldn't have minded, you would have been proud to be here along these, along Adam and Lubu sort of idea, and then we see her absolutely break down into tears. As I said, they could have ended this entire scene, could have ended this whole scene with just the clenched fist, and would have been done, but no, they double down on it and show that she is feeling, she is completely broken by doing this. She never wanted her brother to die, and it was this whole thing, she's just weeping, and she goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, brother, I, you just have to wait a little longer, and I'll be with you in that place, I promise, I'll be with you soon. This is an interesting statement, considering that Buddha also seems to, who we also meet in this episode, Buddha also seems to know exactly what Brunhilde is after. She's after something, Buddha knows it, Brunhilde's shocked that Buddha figured it out, and what does she mean? Remember, there is no after this. When their soul's destroyed, they're gone. So, what does she mean by that place? Or in some other translations, I'll be there, there, with you soon. Does she mean to, in some roundabout way, does she want to die and can't for some reason? Or is there something about it? Does she know something that the rest of us don't know? Is there a place they go to? Is there a a final, like a peaceful resting place where their soul can finally find peace. Maybe she's constantly at war with herself, she hates herself, whatever. I don't know if she's suicidal necessarily, but she says she's almost expecting to lose. Did she start Ragnarok because she's tired of living or something? Like, like it is this one whole elaborate suicide note potentially? Because she says, I'll join you soon. She goes, I promise I will be there with you soon. Almost though she's expecting to die in Ragnarok. She's expecting to lose. I am sitting here wondering, well, you want mankind to win, but is that just like a happy, like, okay, that's like a W, great, but I also still want to lose my fight? Like, because she's of course a Valkyrie. She's going to be a Volend, potentially. Um, because once again, round six screwed up that all up. Uh, the numbers game, but yeah, so there's a lot going on here that's just brought back to the surface now that we know what happened in the manga, now that we know about that extra scene with Hermes at the end of season one, and now with all this information coming here with Brunhilde in the middle of the episode, um, there's just a lot, there's a lot of theor theorizing that we still don't know most of these answers in uh, up to the manga chapter 74, 75, whatever we're at, so a lot to go over there. Um, so yeah, that that's a beautiful scene. Uh, you know, Buddha seems to know the stuff. And then the second half of the episode, I really enjoy this. This is another reason why this episode is one of the best, is because they've taken one of the problems of round five. One of the reasons I didn't like round five was this scene coming up for the later half of the episode, all these extra scenes are so in between rounds, are really super interesting. There's a lot of dialogue, there's a lot of stuff being said, we meet new characters, we get a good showdown. It's all awesome, right? It's interrupted in the manga, cutting in between transitions, very jarring, throughout round five. Round five starts and this scene at the same time. And we cut between them for the next like two or three chapters. That was terrible and it really extended round five to the point like, okay, because the more interesting stuff, round five, I might enjoy a lot more going forward in the same way that I enjoyed round one. Going forward, uh, watching the anime, I have a new appreciation because they were smart and they said, we're gonna take this whole scene, it seems to be anyways, because there's still more to the scene, that's probably in episode six, but they're taking the entire scene, instead of cutting in between, we haven't even met who's in round five yet. We haven't even met who the fighters are, we haven't even seen them talk about it, who's gonna be fighting next, none of that. We go straight from Brunhilde, to the god side, Loki and, and everybody, Ares walked off, uh, Zeus walked off, and Loki walked off, and Loki is confronting Buddha. Now this is a big thing. We meet Buddha, Loki's confronting Buddha all about the Volender, now that gods have been killed and stuff like that, and basically accusing him, you're the, ones, you're the one who taught them how to do this. You're the one who showed the Valkyries how to kill a god, to use the, their divine power to be able to become strong enough to destroy one of us. And does that make you a traitor? And Buddha's just playing the game and Loki wants to kill him. So they're going to fight. We get to meet up with Okita. Sasaki comes back. We see the seven lucky gods, including Bishomanten, uh, Ibusu, all these guys. 
Like, there's a huge, awesome scene here, and it is so well, and it's done very well. The animation is great. The voice acting, Loki's English VA is another one. Loki's English VA is 11 out of 10, right up there with Jack. I swear I've heard this voice in so many animes, uh, and apparently this voice actor who plays Loki, forget his name, um, has been in very few things that I've even seen. So I don't know where I've heard this voice before. I swear to Christ, I've heard this voice in a lot of different animes for a lot of villains, creepy villains. Like, I'm trying to think, was it Full Metal Alchemist? Was it like Old Sailor Moon? Was it New Yasha? Was it a Gundam? Was it, what is this guy from? And uh, apparently nothing I've ever watched, but damn, like he, he does a fantastic as Loki. Great voice acting. Um, round five is going to start, of course, but the idea of moving this and the Loki versus Buddha, like behind the scenes, as I said, this is why round five sort of faltered on a lot of people's lists. And I think a lot of people are going to elevate, myself included, will probably elevate round five with the anime uh, if it's handled well, like everything else has up to episode five here. I think round five is going to be elevated on a lot of people's lists because round five only got done a little dirty because it kept cutting away to this, I would argue, more interesting than the fight itself was this scene. Loki versus Buddha, the implications of the dialogue, uh, and with Bishamonten there, and Okita, and Sasuke, all this other extra shit going on, the subplot, starting off in the background, in between, cutting between the fight. Really, it was like, okay, yeah, it's, you know, they're fighting in round five, but what's going on with Buddha and Loki in the garden? Like, people are more interested, more invested in that than hearing about the backstory or seeing a couple of guys smack each other around a little bit, right? So, that's why I think this was an excellent choice by the anime. This is why episode five is, again, the best episode so far, because they took, they combined that whole scene as one consecutive scene and put it right here before we even see the beginnings of round five. They haven't even set up the arena yet. We haven't even met who's fighting for humanity yet. I know, but I'm not gonna say it. Um, so definitely great. Uh, Loki vs. Buddha scene is great. Best episode so far, battle manga, blah, blah, blah. I think I covered everything on my list. I think I covered all the notes. Uh, big episode review, of course, because it was theorizing and stuff. But what do you guys think? As I said, this one is probably gonna be one of the longest ones. Uh, I hope episode five was great, but and I still think it's the best episode so far, but I won't be upset if the next episode or episode nine or episode 10 are better. I won't be upset by that. Like the fact that episode five, like I'm still excited. It's not like, okay, episode one, we started and we're like, okay, this is far better than season one. But does that mean just because it's better than a mediocre average, sometimes not even good season adaptation, does that mean that season two just gets a pass because it's actually not bad because it's actually decent because it's actually moderately good well no right like once that hype dies down you have to actually judge it accordingly and i think season two has stepped up to the plate and e even if you argue there was some heavy use of cgi in some previous episodes episode five had none of it solid episode great dialogue the pacing is moved around that scene between buddha and loki is being extended i hope i hope that when i start episode six they finish that scene because that scene's not over yet and there's more to go and i'm excited for that we finish that scene before we even start round five so round five has no cutaways i don't want to cut halfway through the fight if you want to do backstories of course you got to do the backstories but don't cut away to an extra scene in between the rounds it didn't work in the manga it was very jarring thankfully they've moved all that um so even if the anime is intending to add scenes I hope that they're not adding something that's really going to take me out of round five because I really want to like round five. A lot of people now, as as we've gone on into the story, have actually enjoyed round five. Though you have to understand, when round five first came out in the manga, it was obviously the weakest round because we had four fantastic rounds. We had round one, two, three, and four to contend with, and at the time, round Round one happened, people were hyped. Round two happened, best round easy. Round three happened, holy shit. Round four, best round of the manga still to this day. And then round five, like round five had too much to live up to and cutting away from it with this Buddha Loki stuff, which was, I still argue more interesting than round five could be, uh, was not a smart planning on the manga's part. Done properly here in the anime, 
I think I'm really going to enjoy the next few episodes. I think I'm going to enjoy round five a lot more. So I know there was a lot to talk about in this particular review, a lot of theorizing, but uh, I think I'm done. I think I got it. So uh, thanks guys so much for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe as always, and we'll see you beautiful people back here for episode six of Record of Ragnarok. Looking forward to it. I hope it's just as good as episode five, because damn, that was a damn fine episode. All right, we'll see you guys back here next time. Have a good one. Sayonara.